Right, well, thank you, Eamon, for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a testimony to the interest and the importance of the uh, decade of centenaries and the events of, uh, you know, 100 years ago, um, that everyone is getting so engaged with these. And it's also quite nice to talk about something that's not the Titanic for a moment. Uh, when I chose this title, Our War, it was really borrowing from a book um, which um, uh, comprised the Thomas Davis lectures um, uh, a few years ago for RTE, which uh, investigated and explored Ireland's engagements with the First World War. And it was, the title was picked you know, specifically to be a kind of pot-stirring, to be a provocative title. And the interesting thing was that nobody at all was provoked by it. They all sort of nodded and said, yes, that's, we're all engaged in this. Whereas 20 years ago, if you had asserted that it was our war, all uh, people in Ireland, uh, um, unionists and nationalists, had a direct interest in the war. Um, uh, uh, you would have, you know, fights would have uh, broken out one sort or another. Um, but we'll hear later from, from, from Jim, uh, you know, very interesting work, uh, recovering those lost histories from parts of uh, uh, Belfast's population. And the thing about, um, um, I have some slides, I'm always a bit surprised, you see what that turns up, but I'm going to give you a few snapshots of the war, I'm not going to give you the whole description, um, uh, you can get that in, in, in books and in other places, but just to say a few things about, about the war, it's a war that reaches places that other wars had not reached before. It's the first total war, really, in Europe. It's an extraordinary experience which sucks in whole nations and communities. It sucks in civilians as well as soldiers. It sucks in women as well as men. Um, and, uh, and in Ireland, it touches, really, every part of the, uh, um, uh, of the, the nation on the community. Um, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about um, recruitment, about uh, you know, who joined up and why, uh, what I want to. Now here, this is of course, uh, the, uh, arguably, uh, or assertedly, the most famous uh, poster of the 20th century, uh, which exists a lot. Uh, Kitchener, born in Kerry, uh, more or less by accident, he's not really Irish, and, uh, um, but uh, uh, what happens at the beginning of the war is this extraordinary mobilization of public opinion uh, behind the war effort, which stretches to Ireland as much as it uh, occurs in Britain, in England, uh, Scotland and Wales. And uh, what we do know um, is that uh, about 200,000 uh, perhaps uh, 210,000 uh, Irish men, mostly men, or almost entirely men, serve in the armed forces during the First World War. Now, they fall into three main categories. There are those who are already in the army at the beginning, uh, and uh, there's about, um, about 50,000 of those. Then there are Kitchener's men, the guys um, who join up, uh, who respond to the urgent call for volunteers, which we see here from this famous poster. Um, and uh, between August 1914 and February 1916, more or less when conscription's adopted in Britain but not in Ireland, about 95,000 men join up. Thirdly, there are those who join up in the rest of the war. In a way, I'm particularly interested in these people. Uh, between February 1916 and November 1918, you've got about 45,000 Irishmen joining up, including nearly 10,000 recruits in the last three and a half months of the war alone. Now, what we know, the received wisdom, every program you've ever seen about the First World War, depicts that rush to the colors, the war fever in 1914, crowds of men trying to join up. And in a way, you can understand that happening. What seems to me very important to try to explain, and I'm not sure I know the answer to it uh, myself yet, is why people are still joining up uh, four years later in very considerable numbers. In fact, recruitment in Ireland goes up a bit in 1918. You'd expect it to have disappeared uh, 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 almost completely by then. And unless we can understand why people joined up in those last three months of the war, um, we'll never understand why they join up at all. And of course, these figures don't include all the Irish people who join up. There are many Irish people from the diaspora, from Australia, from Canada, uh, from New Zealand. Um, I have four great uncles who served in the First World War, five great uncles who served in the First World War, every single one of whom had emigrated to Canada before 1912. Um, and, uh, and they don't appear on some of the statistics, though it seems to me they're as Irish as, as many other people. Uh, but you can break down the statistics. I'm going to give you 
and bear with me, I'll not do this for very long, some facts. I'm a historian, we have to deal in facts, uh, but a little bit about recruitment. Uh, and what we've got here is uh, the statistics by location and by uh, religion. Uh, not quite for the whole war. These figures only go to January 1918 because we only have them broken down in this way for that. So they don't match the, the figures I've already given you precisely. But what these figures show overall is firstly that more Catholics than Protestants. And hence we can assume, though I uh, wouldn't make too easy an assumption about this, more nationalists than unionists join up in Ireland during the First World War. And that's sometimes a surprise. Only in Ulster, nine county Ulster, does the number of Protestants exceed the number of Catholics. Now these figures, however, are largely meaningless without some, so some idea of the proportionality of enlistment. And my next table shows um, the recruiting response as a proportion of the religious group, again by province and again over the period from the start of the war to January 1918. And you've got the, the percentage of the population first and the percentage of the recru recruits second. And what these figures show us, as we might expect, is that overall a higher percentage of Protestants join up than Catholics. All right, Unionists are more likely to join up than Catholics. In Ulster, for example, where the population is just over half, the nine-county Ulster, uh, half Protestant, nearly three-quarters of all the recruits uh, come from that section of the population. But in the other provinces, the figures by no means so clear-cut. Uh, in Munster and Connaught, they're more or less equal. But in Leinster, oddly enough, Catholics are more likely to join up than Protestants. Uh, and what this says, I'm not going to you know, extract anything more from these figures, but what it means is you cannot easily come to any simplistic conclusions about which group is more likely to join up than the other. The easy assumptions we might have in our experience um, uh, you know, uh, from a hundred years perspective um, are undermined by the actuality of the facts. Now, to put the numbers into some sort of context, we can relate the 200,000 odd to the total number of young men living in Ireland at the time. Uh, and if you'd calculate the proportion um, on the 1911 census, about 700,000 men um, between the ages of 15 and 35 lived in Ireland. And the great majority of recruits fall within that uh, uh, sector between 15 and 35, not quite all, but you can say that between a quarter and a third of the available young men in, on the island, strikingly high proportion, joined up to serve in the First World War. And of those who enlisted, many did not return. The casualty, casualty statistics are as imprecise as those for recruiting. You know, we can end up, uh, I mean, it's a kind of fool's uh, 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 errand to try and produce real precision from these figures. Um, uh, but we can say that something over 30,000 uh, uh, men with certainty uh, did not uh, re um, um, uh, return, uh, and certainly perhaps more, which means that the First World War not only reaches parts that other uh, um, uh, you know, events didn't reach, but also it is the greatest demographic, demographic catastrophe to hit Ireland since the famine. You know, a whole sway the people are cut down. Now, why did these people go um, uh, is, of course, a perennial question, the conundrum of recruitment. Uh, I have yet another picture to show you first. Um, I promised uh, my friend Hugh O'Neill a picture of a, of a chaplain. I, I would t entitle this picture um, Church and State in Modern Ireland. Um, or in early 20th century Ireland. What you've got on the left here is Father Brown, the famous photographer. He's the man who was on the Titanic from Southampton to Cove before he was summoned off um, with his uncle, um, his brother beside him in the middle and his uncle, the Bishop of Cloyne, uh, um, um, sitting there. Um, Brown went on to be a, a chaplain with the uh, Irish guards and took wonderful uh, photographs uh, along the Western Front. And again, that subverts some of our uh, perceptions we might have of uh, joining up. Now, one reason people joined up was the notion that it was right to do so. I think we, uh, we have to be a bit careful about being too patronizing about the past and that when we see the terrible things that happened to people who joined up, we think they must have been fools in those famous words of Tom Kettle, uh, fools like uh, this fool and uh, now with the foolish dead. And, uh, and sure, they were, we feel, um, um, uh, misled 
into an experience which very few anticipated. Nevertheless, it seems to me that the decisions made for recruiting are not, again, you know, simple or simplistic, though many people thought it, again, was the right thing to do. Um, uh, the, the issue given at the time, here's a, a, a recruiting pamphlet from very early in the war, uh, was that um, the um, obligation of Irishmen uh, remember, Belgium, list nine, defend yourselves, it says. And here was the militaristic, aggressive, imperialistic Germany laying waste to civilians, to women and children um, in Belgium, um, breaking the rules, um, and that it was appropriate for Ireland to go to the aid of gallant little Belgium. And indeed, for many Catholics in Ireland, gallant Catholic little Belgium um, uh, uh, was, was, was part of the... Um, um, uh, you know, the, the appeal. I used this on the uh, a cover of a book I, I published um, uh, oh, 10 or 12 years ago. The publisher was a bit anxious about using it because he thought it would restrict sales in Germany. Um, um, so, uh, 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 but there you are, we managed to get away with it. Um, but this was an appeal, a really quite important appeal um, as it went through. And, um, and certainly the... Uh, um, Available manpower in Ireland, uh, in many respects, was already militarized, was already disposed to join up into armed forces um, for political ends. And, of course, going to war is, 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 is state violence for a political end. This is uh, John Redmond inspecting members of the Irish uh, volunteers, um, who had, of course, um, organized themselves in conscious um, imitation of the Ulster volunteers to support uh, home rule. And what David Fitzpatrick, the, the historian at Trinity College Dublin, has discovered is that um, individuals, either uh, unionists in the Ulster Volunteers or nationalists in the Irish Volunteers, were themselves more likely to join up in, in the autumn of ni on winter of 1914 than other sorts of people. So in a kind of odd way, those people who are most committed to nationalism, by and large, are not, I mean, there's an extreme, uh, uh, this extreme separatist wing do not subscribe to this, but by and large, the more committed nationalists who'd already joined the Irish volunteers joined the British army more, more readily um, than their, um, their non-militarized uh, 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 colleagues. And the same, and, and there's, uh, the proportions of Irish volunteers and Ulster volunteers joining up are strikingly, strikingly similar. Now, after the war, these guys who joined up then had to try and explain when they came back to an Ireland that was very different. Um, they had to explain why um, or to find some reason why they'd gone away to, to fight. And you find some clues to these on those um, uh, monuments that stand about uh, um, the landscape in Ireland um, commemorating men of the war. This is the famous one in Cork put up by a uh, um, nationalist uh, ex-servicemen's association, the Cork Independent Ex-Servicemen's Club, not the British Legion. Um, and what's the explanation they produce in, on St. Patrick's Day, 1925, when they dedicate this memorial, is they went um, 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 in memory of their comrades who fell in the Great War fighting for the freedom of small nations. So they're suggesting in 1925 that they were fighting for freedom of small nations, with which they might have suggested Ireland as well, which was part of Redmond's appeal for people to join up. It's Ireland's obligation to join up as well as uh, um, uh, 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 Britain's. But there are other reasons why people join up. Here's the famous picture of the Dublin Pals on the grounds of um, Lansdowne Road. The Aviva Stadium is very different today. Um, uh, but these were the footballers. Um, Colonel Browning, F.H. Browning, who's the president of the Irish Rugby Football Union, said, come along, lads. This is going to be a, like a great international fixture, and we don't want to miss this. There's also that sense of exhilaration. This is the dangerous sports clubs. These are young men. These are the guys who drive motor bikes and their mother's mad will worry. Um, and, uh, and suddenly it's legitimized doing this adventurous stuff. Oh, we're proud of you, lad. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's an irresistibility to this as well. And here they are marching off uh, past uh, suitably what was then the Kildare Street Club, bastion of unionism in Dublin, and now the Alliance Francaise. They're going off to fight by the sides of the uh, French. So there's a strange sort of symmetry uh, to that. This is Carson inspecting the Ulster volunteers to remind us 
that, of course, their commitment to the Union, um, the moment of delivery to that commitment, comes in August 1914 and September 1914. Although Carson wants to negotiate the commitment, he, he claims he, he, he's not going to set up any conditions, but in fact, he wants, as does uh, Redmond, he wants a specifically local, identifiable unit, and this emerges as the 36th Ulster Division. In the rest of Ireland, you've got the 16th Irish Division, um, which is sometimes known as Redmond's Pets. And then there's another division, which is sometimes forgotten, though in the presence of Philip Orr here, uh, we can't forget it because he's written so movingly about its experiences, is the 10th Irish Division, who are the first to join up in some ways and the first to see action. And they don't see action. It's not Belgium or France, um, but uh, elsewhere. Ah, no, I've overrun myself slightly. Here's a postcard from the autumn of 1914 um, got in. And it, quite interestingly, I always assumed that this, with this cod Irish accent, that this is assumed to be an Irish nationalist. And in fact, I'm not sure it is. It could as readily be an Ulster Unionist, who, remember, are gearing up to fight traitorous, potentially traitorously, against a, a, an English British government whom they think have, uh, are going to sell them down the river. And so in fact it could be either. I mean this might be an English person's vision of Ireland and we won't, don't want to dwell on it. Um, uh, uh, but it, it uh, reminds us that there also um, there's a business opportunity for the postcard seller. Uh, this postcard was sent by a guy from Bally Kindler, a um, man who survived the war, happily who joined up in the Ulster, uh, uh, in the Ulster Division. But the first the first guys who go, they go here, they go to Suvla, uh, to Suvla Bay, to Gallipoli, that disastrous campaign in 1915 which was going to uh, solve the war in one, uh, uh, in one go. Um, and uh, uh, the engagement at Suvla on that distant strand and that distant place um, sometimes gets forgotten and it ought not to be. Um, but it, it led to that remarkable um, uh, uh, and uh, poignant song, The Foggy Jew, written by a, a, a County Down man, Father or Canon O'Neill, um, in which that line, "'Twas better to die neath an Irish sky than at Suvla or Sed El Bar, uh, which takes you to another, of course, uh, um, um, line of tension through the war. Here's a, um, um, uh, uh, you know, an Irish uh, fusilier um, um, in, in the trenches at but the place, of course, which is remembered more abundantly and more committedly, if you like, in, in Ulster is here. This beautiful painting by an Irish painter, William Orpen, a uh, Dublin Protestant. Uh, uh, the two of the greatest Irish painters of the early 20th century um, both paint the war in different ways. Um, if you haven't, you must go upstairs. You probably have to come back when it's open and look at the laveries upstairs. Um, uh, there's a wonderful painting up, up there from my studio window in, in 1917 uh, depicting a German air raid in London and the beautiful Hazel Lavery looking up uh, in some uh, um, anxiety uh, at this. Well, Lavery never went to France during the war, in fact, he painted the home front. He goes to France in 1919, but Orban goes in 1917, and he goes to the Somme battlefield, and he paints these extraordinary pictures. This is the Somme battlefield a year on. Uh, uh, here's a picture from the early days. The Battle of the Somme was thought to be a victory and a great triumph. Um, here are men of the 36th Ulster Division in a very typical uh, kind of pose. And you look into the faces of these men and you wonder um, what had driven them there, what had impelled them to be there, and what on earth did they think they were doing once they got there. Um, here are men, however, of the 16th Irish Division. Now, this is the Nationalist Division. And they don't arrive in the Somme until September. And they have quite a successful time in September. Um, they don't have that... Uh, awful, appalling casualties to quite the same extent, which the Ulster Division suffer, of course, on the 1st of July. Um, but you can see these guys have already collected a few trophies. Uh, the, there's a man, on the, two men in the front, three of them, wearing German Pickelhaubers, those classic uh, uh, German uh, um, 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 helmets. Uh, and so part of this narrative of the war, of course, takes us to the Western Front. And many of you perhaps have been there and to those um, extraordinary and resonant and beautiful and sad cemeteries, um, uh, uh, which in that richer earth, a richer dust concealed um, in a faraway field that is forever, for these men, Ireland, um, and not uh, England in the old Rupert Brooke words. Nevertheless, there are other places the war goes 
Here we are, well, sinking ships. The Lusitania is torpedoed in May 1915. Nearly 1,200 die in this. Um, uh, and this is here's a propaganda poster, or a recruiting poster, join an Irish regiment. This, here are civilians being killed. But on the Lusitania, there are five Newry men. Uh, four of them are firemen. They're in the bowels of this ship. They go down with this ship. Um, and it reminds us that it's not just soldiers who get involved in this. Indeed, these aren't sailors, these are civilians, these are merchant mariners. And part of the recovery, of the wonderful recovery of the history of those times, um, is embedded in the kinds of local um, history groups who are beginning to produce lists and ex explorations of, of, of local history. And I learned this, this is, I mean, I think a particularly good one. Um, um, a, uh, uh, um, it gives a listing of Newry's this is for the First and Second World War, uh, but it, it draws its um, uh, selection as widely as possible so that you have nurses, you have civilians, and you have these five sailors. I mean, seaports um, um, you know, get hit by this. There's a Newry ship goes down, I think, in 1917, and there are uh, at least two sets of brothers on the, on the boat, and you get these clusters of people, which are very characteristic of the 1st of July, people who knew each other, and you can spot them, and, and in battles on the Western Front, but it, it takes us further away. And of course, the war also influences the home front. Indeed, the whole concept of the home front is, is, a, is a result of the First World War. Here are our, our women in Lampkins, uh, a tobacco factory in Cork, packing uh, uh, cigarettes for the troops, um, um, uh, there they are to go. Uh, they didn't seem to come with a health warning in those days, um, um, and perhaps uh, that's understandable. Um, here's a, a, a drawing by William Connor, um, Connor Cafe across the road here, uh, which you can visit. Um, it used to be a studio of a um, woman called um, Madeline Ewart at Mackey's. Um, engaged in making munitions here in West Belfast, and a new experience for many of these people, drawing them out of the private sphere and into you know, new and ex unexpected places. This is from Dublin, um, a picture from the post office archives um, of a post office, and allegedly, uh, or so the caption tell us, these are separation women waiting for the post office to open to get their payments. And separation women received, as it were, family allowances uh, for their dependents, husbands, sometimes sons, um, um, uh, and uh, um, who made up the, um, uh, their income and was paid directly to these women. And these are women who perhaps had money in their hands as of right for the first time. They didn't have to wait on their man coming back you know, on a Friday night. Um, they got it directly. And it, it empowered them in interesting and, and, and new ways. There was a whole narrative of how many of them you know, spent it on drink and the, you know, women couldn't, of course, handle this. Uh, um, uh, assertions of that sort. But for the great majority of these ordinary people, now that's a term I don't much like, but um, these people um, who are not exceptional in any ways, they're every man and every woman here, and you look again in these faces and you wonder what the stories are behind them. Some of them have left traces, and it's, it's, it, it's you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, you know it's, it's the obligation of, of us all, and historians like me, to try and recover those stories um, as well. And of course, the rising that comes to Dublin, um, oh, and here's another picture Again, this is the uh, savings bank. Um, um, but again, it's quite interesting, the vividness of these pictures of these um, um, anonymous people. They exist only in this photograph. Um, uh, but they live through these extraordinary events, and of course, it influences their families and their stories. Uh, and the damage in Dublin is, many, in many, uh, by many common commentators, likened to the damage done on the Western Front, Ypres on the Liffey. Um, um, uh, said one newspaper, uh, and which suggests that the First World War battlefields extend not just to Gallipoli, not just to the Western Front, but uh, um, reached um, um, home as well in a very uh, specific way. Uh, and all of this is part of a seamless robe of history, uh, which we, we, we are coming to, I think, um, 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 uh, revisit in very important ways in the future. Um, and now, 
And then there are all these monuments that exist about the place. I play games with people who are supposed to shout out and tell us where these, where these are, because sometimes you pass by these, um, 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 the, these uh, sites without really looking at them. There's a very interesting book by a, a, a distinguished cultural historian called Jay Winter, which he calls Sites of Memory, Sites of Mourning. Um, and it's, he takes this from a, a, a French school of history, um, which uh, are um, um, focus in on the lieu de mémoire, the places of memory. And these become very important sites where people, and the rituals around them, now sometimes they're very politicized, um, but they become a place because the soldiers are buried where they fall, because they lie in those foreign fields, there is no grave to visit or grave to visit easily. It's, I mean, many of us, I mean, I was the first of my family to visit the graves of my great uncles in, um, uh, in France over the past 20 years. And in fact, there have been, you know, increasing trips and, and, and journeys to the Western Front of people making those journeys for the first time. In the 1920s, this wasn't possible. And it may be that the only place you could come to is the War Memorial to reflect on your loss, a kind of surrogate grave. And what the War Memorials tell us, like the one in Cork, they also embody some ideas of what the war was about. Now, this is Banbridge, and Banbridge is actually very interesting and extremely unusual because you've got a soldier cheering for the end of the war. Is it relief that he's come home alive? And is that appropriate? Is it victory? We've won. And that's a kind of thing that we don't celebrate anymore. It's not thought appropriate. Uh, don't mention the war. You know, they, we, these are all inclusive. But unless you understand some of the, the emotions of the time, we will not fully understand what was going on then as, as now. But there are very, very few memorials like this um, um, uh, across the world that, that I have seen. Most of them, what the Australians call sad diggers, um, soldiers in mourning, you know, with arms reversed, heads down, and there are a number of those in the province. And of course, they're not just in the south. This one's in uh, uh, Drogheda. It'd been restored recently. Um, this last 11th of November, the British ambassador came and laid a wreath in it. And there were moments in the past 30 years, uh, many of them, I should have thought, um, that such a thing could never imagine happening. But the place that these memorials is also interesting, these sites of memory. This memorial is between the barracks and the railway station. And every soldier who joined up in, in, in Dundalk or Drogheda and goes to the barracks marched past that spot. And that's why the memorial is where it is. And it's that kind of local history that gives you the depth and the feel um, and the texture of, of the times as well. And the most recent one, or the most, uh, not what the nearest one, is this one down at, uh, uh, down at Queen's, which is, of course, a very grand memorial. Uh, but there are stories to be extracted from these, um, to breathe life into these inanimate uh, uh, objects. So, We've got an extraordinary experience that falls across the, uh, um, uh, of Europe and Ireland in those four and a half years between 1914 and 1918. Um, and we've got the challenge, and I think the way that increasingly we're being able to gauge this is with the micro stories, the individual stories of valor, of endurance, of cowardice as well, of, of uh, aggressiveness and of people searching uh, peace through um, those, those awful events, of families under strain, um, but it touches um, everyone. And so um, uh, I will leave you with this, with this image and uh, um, um, encourage you all to recover as you can your family history and look again in your cupboards um, uh, in the hope that you might find one of those blessed, wonderful treasure troves of records um, which uh, um, uh, so uh, bring back um, to us and, and renew our interest in, in that extraordinary, uh, extraordinary period. Thank you. There we go.